it's really great to be here. I, um, I used to uh, be the director of development for MAPS um, years ago, and so it's, uh, it's, and when we had a conference then, there was like, I think, like 300 people, and we were really, really excited that there was 300 people coming to a MAPS conference. Um, to see, uh, I think I talked to Brad yesterday that there were 1,800 people registered for the conference. Um, and uh, so it's great to see that not just our issue around cannabis is moving forward at a remarkable pace, but also um, that uh, psychedelic science is, is moving forward. And, um, you know, one of the things that, so the way I'm going to kind of do this is I'm going to kind of give sort of a, a larger point uh, and then talk about sort of my story through that and then uh, move into sort of where uh, where I think uh, the, the cannabis industry is moving and how that relates to all of our political and scientific goals. Um, and to, to start with that, I would just say that most of my life I, I thought that I had to choose between my entrepreneurial interests and making a lot of money. Um, and my desire to change the world in some positive way. Um, and then all of a sudden, through all the efforts that we've all been involved with in changing the laws, uh, all of a sudden a, a new industry started uh, being created. And then I all of a sudden noticed that there was a spot for my entrepreneurial desires and that those two things weren't, in fact, separate, but in fact were, were intertwined in a really... Uh, unique way. Um, and that's sort of where the idea to create the ArcView group uh, came from. And basically, the ArcView group, we believe that business is the most powerful platform for political change and that the development of a responsible, respectable, and well and uh, profitable and politically engaged cannabis industry will uh, likely be the single biggest factor in the end of marijuana prohibition. Um, and so um, to that end, um, we, we started in 2010. Um, I started with Steve D'Angelo uh, from Harborside Health Center, uh, basically because we saw this opportunity where there were all these people that were interested in investing in the cannabis industry, and also all these people who were looking to create businesses in the cannabis industry, but they weren't finding each other. And they were also missing some key skill sets, right? So you had a lot of people with great business ideas but didn't know how to scale a business, didn't know how to speak to investors about, about those sorts of things, didn't understand that piece of it. And then you had investors um, who were used to investing in their own spaces but didn't know much about investing in this space because it's very idiosyncratic. Um, and so... Um, before I get all into that, I'm curious actually, this, is a, this looks like a pretty unique group of people uh, here, and I'm curious kind of how many people here um, uh, would consider themselves sort of working in the nonprofit realm of this space? Okay. And how many people in the for-profit realm of this space? And you can raise your hand for multiple ones if you find yourself in both categories. And then how many people would say they identify primarily um, either as a scientist or working on the science part of this? Cool. And then how many people would say that they work primarily on the political side of this? Okay. Wow, okay. So it's a really, it's a, it's a pretty, it's a fairly even, uh, even mix. Um, so one of the things um, that, let me say, I'm trying to think which direction I want to go here. Let me actually go through and just talk a little bit about um, ArcView first before I get into some of the, the things. Um, how does this work? Here we go this way. Okay. So the, 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 the big project we've been working on mainly lately is this investor network. And basically, if you've ever seen the show Shark Tank, it works very similar to that. Uh, we have about 50 investors uh, that are all accredited investors looking to invest $50,000 or more uh, into this sector. And we all gather once a quarter. And then companies come and pitch the investors on making investments in their companies. And the only requirement is that these companies have to have some 
connection to the cannabis industry and also we have to feel that by funding that kind of an investment that it would make a positive impact on uh, on the industry uh, and on the politics of this space so it's got to be something that would look that 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 would increase the responsibility of uh, of the industry um, and so we gather each quarter to do that and the the media has been very excited about what we're doing, interestingly enough. There are tons of, not, of, of groups like this around the country uh, that do this for all kinds of different uh, things, but the media is completely not interested in that. But they are fascinated by the rise of the cannabis industry. And so finally, we're starting to get coverage. Now, this is a very provocative image. We were not at, so thrilled with the cover image here. But the entire article is about our, um, our investor network and how you know you've got a, an interesting mix of people uh, in that investor network. You've got um, we've got billionaires and people representing uh, uh, venture capital funds, and then we also have people who've been some of the biggest donors to drug policy reform that are sitting at that table as well, um, who are looking to invest in the in the sector uh, as as well, um, and also some people who are the representatives of some of the best the biggest brands in our sector who are looking to make acquisitions and other things and looking at how this all plays out uh, in the big scheme of things. But the real subversive act in all of this is that, you know, if you look at the quotes that I have in this article, I talk about how, you know, this is about, you know, changing the world and how business is a powerful platform for political change and how this looks a lot like the renewable energy industry and how this looks a lot like the organic foods industry and how much impact has been created out of those industries. And so what you're finding is that people who really only care about money generally um, are reading about how their care of money could actually make a positive difference in the world and make them more money. <laughs> um, and so that's the great subversive act uh, in all of this that, I, that, I, that really gets me going. Um, and this is a, uh, an example of uh, one of our uh, meetings. This was in Seattle. We had the mayor of Seattle come and speak to us uh, after the, the meeting. This is Amy Poinsett from MJ Freeway. And MJ Freeway has a, uh, uh, a point of sale and inventory management system that they are um, they have for dispensaries and uh, and she's pitching to a group of uh, investors and also other presenters uh, that were presenting there uh, uh, as well for an investment um, and uh, so I will say well what, what opportunities are there really in this space and uh, there was a great quote by uh, Mark Twain, he said that uh, when there's a gold rush on, it's a good time to be in the pick and shovel business. Uh, and uh, the same thing I think is true here, and there's this additional reason why in the cannabis industry being in, a, in something ancillary is generally more appealing for people, and that is, is that the legal risk is greatly reduced. Um, and so some of the types of businesses that are developing um, uh, we've identified sort of 12 segments, and I'll kind of walk through them a little bit and talk a little bit about each of them. Um, product standards, obviously, I think I mentioned them. Um, Steep Hill is a great example of product standards. Um, uh, Steep Hill Labs and other laboratories and other um, a Clean Green is another uh, sort of organic certified for, uh, for cannabis. Uh, consumer information. This would be things like... MJ Business Daily and um, uh, web portals like uh, Weed Maps, uh, Sticky Guide, Leafly, uh, these sorts of things. Advertising and promotion, obviously, all these different businesses need uh, advertising and promotion services just like any other business. That's a great opportunity. Human resources. I am shocked that, that nobody's really in this space yet. Um, all these new companies that are getting started, they need... They need, um, they need staffing. They need people, they need to go out and find people that understand cannabis and also understand the business things that they need. That's the biggest problem I think facing the industry right now is talent that you could actually just plug right in and who are willing to work for equity <laughs> uh, at this point. Um, and so I'm, I'm, that's an area where I'm just shocked there isn't more action. Um, business information, um, so that would also do things like MJ Business Daily and um, uh, a sea change 
uh, research, which I'll talk about as one of the projects we're working on uh, later. Uh, information management, point of sale systems, um, uh, other ways of tracking um, uh, what's going into the plants for the different regulators, etc. That's an interesting area. Um, professional services, so financial services and um, uh, legal services, etc. Uh, live experiences, um, uh, things like like this, um, or like um, you know various uh, festivals uh, and uh, uh, things like actually a lot of things happening in Denver this weekend um, for uh, 420. Um, and uh, agriculture. So the interesting thing about agriculture is that this is one area where I think that cannabis is going to be creating a lot more innovation now that the legal barriers are starting to fall. Um, you know, Michael Pollan in, in his book Botany of Desire talked a lot about you know how cannabis and humans have sort of evolved together and the, the relation between them and, and how uh, they've sort of danced with each other through history. And uh, and that's true, and also to a large degree, a lot of the innovation that could happen in those areas has been stymied either by the fact that you can't, can't do it on the research front or you can't do it on the business front. But there's all these people who are um, these plant scientists for all these great companies around the country who have, would love to be playing with cannabis but aren't. Um, and so I think we're going to start seeing a lot more innovation um, in the plant science uh, realm. One of the companies at our, uh, at our uh, angel group um, is out of Sweden, and they're like, you know, a, a company that's been, you know, funded heavily to develop new LED technologies. And, uh, and then, so now they're starting a special thing just in the U.S. to really look at at cannabis, and I think they're like the, f you know, a c the first few of what's going to be a real wave of uh, of people coming uh, coming into uh, work with these plants. Um, cannabis complements, uh, obviously, uh, you know, consumption devices, etc. And now the thing about consumption devices and also agriculture is that like it's not like cannabis is new. It's not like this is really a new industry. It's just this both those industries have been lying um, for a long time. Right? In the agriculture business they've said that they're growing to that they're growing tomatoes and in the cannabis complement business they're, they're saying that it's for tobacco. Um, and so one of the areas I see for opportunity uh, is in both of those sectors um, you're starting to see ag uh, companies that have nutrients and, and uh, uh, soils and stuff, you're starting to see a lot of them start to come out and actually say what they're, what they're actually for. Um, and, uh, and, and I admire that bravery and I also think that it's, it's also partly about changing the rules of the game in a way that reward people who are willing to take the risk to announce what they actually do uh, because it creates customer loyalty, it creates an opportunity for them to sell their products and dispensaries, etc., etc. Um, and, and this kind of goes to a, a larger point. Oh, well, I'll, I'll wait on that one. Um, then there's like cannabis lifestyle stuff like, like different brands um, uh, in uh, you know, clothing brands and different uh, uh, media brands, etc., uh, ways of uh, uh, directing that. And also, we're starting to see a little shift in cannabis lifestyle stuff too. In the past, a lot of it has been focused mainly on cannabis, like people who for whom cannabis is sort of probably one of their main identifiers. Like if you were to ask them, like, what do you identify as? They might, you know, first identify as their gender and then maybe identify as you know where they live their region uh, maybe their profession um, and then maybe their cannabis consumption or you know it kind of fits in the top three or four identifiers but I think now we're starting to see marketing that actually is reaching the silent majority of cannabis consumers for whom their identifier as a cannabis consumer is actually naturally falls maybe at like number eight nine or ten of their identifiers um, and so I, I think we're going to see some shifts in the marketing um, there. Um, and then obviously hemp. I mean, the only reason hemp is illegal is because cannabis is illegal at the moment. And so uh, once we're starting, we're going to see some, a lot more hemp production, hopefully, uh, in the U.S. Uh, as these things start to shift. And I would just say that on, on all of these, you've got a... Um, uh, you've got a phenomenon uh, where 
the rules of the game are changing in a way that regardless of whether you care about people sitting in prison or not, the rules of the game are changing in a way that to win means to change the laws. To win means to get people out of prison. One of the things that annoyed me so much when I was, uh, I was, I was a, a fundraiser for the Marijuana Policy Project for many years, and the, 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 the thing that annoyed me so much is when I would talk to, um, when I would talk to uh, people that were, had a nutrient line, um, or talk to people who had a really awesome vaporizer. And I'd be like, oh, it's so great that you're in this market. Oh, this is great. What, what, would you like to sponsor our fundraiser? And they'd be like, no, no way, no, we can't even talk about that. And I just, that would just, my gut would just turn. And I'd be like, really? You're not going to support your own consumers to not be criminals? But eventually, I kind of got it, I realized that that was just part of, like, that's just how the rules were set up. Like, there was only going to be so many people that were willing to sort of overcome that gut level reaction because that wasn't their number one priority. And so if we wanted to change how that acted, then we needed to create a new, a, a new set of rules that rewarded the behavior of, of, um, of, of moving towards that. And you may notice in my speech that... Um, I talk as if this is already here, and it's not. <laughs> right? We're talking about two states, and we haven't even heard from the Justice Department. And I think that that really highlights one of the things that's great about the industry and one of the things that we have to be really, really careful about, and one of the things I even have to be really careful about because I see myself moving down this path, which is that this isn't over yet. right? Like The, the things I'm talking about are really, you know, talking about it almost as if I'm pretty sure they're about to happen, so we're going to start acting as though they've already have. Um, <laughs> but that is what's happening in the business community. When I talk to investors and when I talk, and, and the media, the way the media has been covering this over the last two months, you'd think cannabis was already legal in the U.S., right? Um, and in some ways, that's really good. It's really good because there's a sense of inevitability. And there's a sense of investors are, I mean, people you would just never expect are coming out of the woodworks and calling me and being like, how do I get in? And I'm like, wait, do you realize how many people call me asking to invest in dispensaries? And I'm like, you know, you'd be out of prison for that. And like, oh, yeah, yeah, but, but it's, okay. yeah, but, oh, no, it's, but it's already happening. I mean, now the guy at the local, whatever, was talking about it the other day. Like, so there's this social perception that doesn't match up with the politi actual political perception. Um, and so I'm in this interesting space, and I think some of us probably all are in that interesting space of both wanting to, to, to fan those flames a little bit, because obviously it's creating momentum, while also reminding people that, one, there's still a lot of risk, and two, um, that this isn't inevitable, right? I mean, for most of my life, I've been, people have told me that what I'm doing is uh, hopeless, that, that, that cannabis will never be legal, so why take action? And then all of a sudden, almost overnight, all those same people say, it's inevitable, why take action? Right? <laughs> the only common thread between both of those things is that it absolves the person with the opinion of doing anything. Um, but the only way that this isn't inevitable is if, is if we stop taking action. Um, and one of the things also, I used to think that the only way to take action was like to, to donate to a campaign or to, um, or, or to you know, write a letter to the editor or send a letter to a member of Congress. Um, but I've, I've since expanded that to include starting a business in this sector, that that is an incredible act of political engagement, even for people that don't notice that that's what they're doing. Um, and also, uh, uh, you know, being out, you know, being out. We've seen how much that's impacted the, uh, the, in the gay rights community. Um, and we're going to see how it, how it impacts uh, here as well as more and more people uh, come out of the closet. Um, the, 
The, um, so I just went through real quick the, the couple things that we're working on, right? So we've got this uh, uh, sea change research, and sea change research put out the first big market report. One of the biggest things that's keeping investment from happening in this sector is that people don't have the kind of market data that they have in other sectors. And so we're endeavoring to solve that problem. Um, came out with a report in 2011. We're coming out with another one uh, in 2013, which will go much, much deeper. Um, Canisher, business insurance for dispensaries and for uh, uh, cultivation uh, facilities. Really important thing, a lot of people are signing up for insurance, uh, but the insurance company won't actually cover them. So in a situation, so the broker basically got it, the broker signs them up, and then uh, if there's a claim, they wind up having a really big problem actually getting um, getting covered. Um, and so Canisher, uh, we teamed up with some great people um, to launch that, raised capital for it, and that's on its way. And then something we're about to launch is uh, WeCanna, uh, which is a crowdfunding platform for the uh, cannabis industry. One of the things about running an investor network that's only for accredited investors is that only accredited investors can really be part of it. And so we wanted to create a crowdfunding platform sort of like um, Kickstarter or Indiegogo, but for the cannabis industry. And we've got an incredible track. We haven't even launched yet, and we're getting incredible uh, attention um, on this. And I think it's going to be huge. I'd say the two biggest business stories of 2013 that most people don't know will be the two biggest business stories of 2013 are the rise of the legal cannabis industry and the rise of the crowdfunding industry. Uh, and so we decided to put them together. Um, to uh, bring the cannabis industry to everybody and serve as a, a sort of a, uh, an example uh, for people of what can be done in this space that can have a positive uh, impact. Um, so I think I will, um, I will stop there with one last point, which is that the hippies keep being right. We were, we're right about personal computing. Yes. <laughs> we're right about renewable energy. We're right about organic foods and write about yoga, and write about war, write about war and write about, uh, and write about cannabis. Uh, and those are, those are five of the seven things I just announced. We're also the five biggest business stories of the last couple decades. And this is the next great American industry, and I'm thrilled to be building it with all of you. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm Mimi Pereg, and... Uh, I'm actually need to wait till it comes up, but um, meanwhile, I will just say a couple of words about um, WAM, which is where I got my um, crowd beginnings and mentored under the tutelage of Valerie Corral, and where I got my heart for this business. And four years ago, uh, Rick Dobbin sent Val and I to Israel to, um, to try and see if we could help, and I ended up staying. So this starts really from my desire to extend compassion in the world. And uh, this morning, uh, um, Alan mentioned that, um, that um, all the way down the line, uh, Ram had worked with local governments. Well, um, that's, a, that's, that's not stated strongly enough. Ram did more than just work with local governments. Ram taught the local governments how to work. And, uh, and I, I want to thank Val for that because that's what I have to take to Israel. They don't, they don't know. We're helping them create, we're co-creating reality with our government there. And, uh, and, and what we are co-creating is an experience uh, where research is a friendly environment. So that's what I want to share with you today. Even today, Valerie Corral and Ram, they, they recently won uh, Guam won the best dispensary or best, uh, what was it, Val? Was it dispensary that you guys won? Collective, best collective three years in a row, and that's only because it's only a three-year-old prize, and, and Valerie herself won best local hero of Santa Cruz a few weeks ago. Right. All right, so first of all, I want to start off by saying that Israel has a long tradition of cannabis research. 
Back when I was still crawling around and trying to figure out how to walk, Raphael Mishulam was isolating THC. And he won the Israel Prize for that, and it's been a prestigious experience working with cannabis in Israel ever since. So fast forward to 2009, the movement got its go-ahead to start building our first farms, and um, we built a mass distribution center. And here we have Yossi Segev, the founder of that mass distribution center, which is called Mechkar, uh, rejoicing near the second Kandak harvest. And on the distribution end, we were initially given a small room in Building 6 in a mental hospital called Abarbanel in a city just south of Tel Aviv. And the reason that we were given a room in a mental hospital was um, that the director of the hospital was Dr. Yehuda Baruch, and uh, he uh, was the broad forefront of the movement. And um, he had the feeling that a lot of people would be coming through the hospital to pick up their cannabis that normally didn't see mentally ill patients. And he wanted to show people that mental illness is real because there's a perception, a cultural perception in Israel that mental illness is just people faking it. So it was his dream that people would come in to get their cannabis from all sectors and would learn how um, mental illness is, a, is something that needs to be addressed and taken seriously. And uh, here we have a picture of um, Boaz Vakta, a major activist in medical marijuana in Israel, um, and he's training new patients in building six, which until today is the job that I do, now I do it in a better building. So let's talk a little bit about how medical marijuana actually is viewed in Israel. First of all, it's given as an end-of-life medication, a last resort medication. You have to have proven that for at least a year you've tried other medications before you can get it. It's currently given to about 12,000 people. The government hopes to grow that to 40,000 within the next five years. It's a really small country and word is spreading fast. If everybody that wanted it could get it, we might be at about 100,000 right now. Um, in Israel, medical cannabis is not associated with hippies, fakers, slackers. It's used by all ages and all religions, and many deeply conservative and religious people use medical cannabis. And they come through the doors terrified, having never seen it before, and quickly become evangelists. <laughs> so, who can get a license? Okay, so right now, as of today, People with chronic pain due to proven organic etiology, orphan diseases, HIV patients, inflammatory bowel disease, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, malignant tumors, psychotic episodes, panic attacks, generalized anxiety disorder, and motivational syndrome. And I wanted to mention that this list is subject to change any time by a Ministry of Health or by police request not uh, by Mechkar, the um, distributor. Oops, how did that happen? How can I turn into the opposite direction? Okay, here we go. Well, so what if I'm not on that list? Uh, what am I going to do about that? Well, this is one of the main reasons to do research in Israel today, is we want to make that list a lot longer. Every, condi every condition that anybody can think of in this room must be explored via clinical trials in order to understand why cannabis works and when it works. And how, how can we do that? Well, we have the sympathetic government already, we have grows in progress, we have storage licenses, and a very important thing to remember is that Israel has national health care. I'll talk a little bit later about why national health care is important in this whole picture. I wanted to throw up some pictures of what our new center looks like. In 2010, we moved into a center three buildings down from room six. This is building nine. In the top left-hand corner, you have a courtyard where patients wait till they get their medication. In the top right, we have a kiosk. In the bottom left, we have an organic chemist lab that's now filled out with a lot more machines. And in the bottom right, you have a um, national locker. 
um, for storage, and that's about half of it. Oh, no switch to do. Okay, and simultaneously we're already busy gathering data. So um, during these last three and a half years that we've been in business, um, Machkar has collected vast amounts of data which we've presented to Dr. Yehuda Baruch following his requests, such as how much is needed to treat different conditions and strain preferences by conditions. But this is merely the beginning. I wanted to talk a bit about subsidies to cannabis in Israel. Um, volcanoes are partially uh, or fully subsidized by three of Israel's um, four healthcare groups and four of Israel's patient care groups, uh, such as the victims of the Holocaust, subsidize volcanoes. Vaporizers are placed in four of the biggest hospitals. Um, and you can request a private balloon and mouthpiece and walk around to your treatments uh, using a volcano. And Israel is currently the only country in the world to approve a medical device for uh, cannabis use inside a hospital setting. As of last week, Maccabi, the biggest healthcare provider in Israel, subsidizes patients' cannabis just like any other medication. saying about this slide that this stuff did not just happen. This was the brainchild of two very dedicated brothers, South African brothers from volcanomedic.co.io who went around to hospitals and pounded on doors until they got doctors to let the volcanoes in. A lot of hard work. I think I should say something about some problematic issues in Israel too. Um, I think that some of the rules on patients' medical cannabis usage licenses provide undue hardship presently, and I'm going to work to help try to change that. Um, we can't produce anything but oil and bud after uh, June 1st in Israel. And um, uh, another problem is that once you heal, you might lose your license in Israel. Secondary indications are ignored. So if you got a license for cancer and it was to reduce nausea, as soon as you finish all of your treatments, your license will not be renewed. And, um, and I don't think that's a good idea. And our monthly gram rate is low. It averages about 20 grams a month. Now, 20 grams is about 20 joints. So that really puts people into a hardship that I don't think that they deserve or is right. So um, what you see in this picture is a, a very talented volunteer, Moshe Ichiel's cookies. He later formed a company called Cannabis to make these kinds of cookies, which, uh, and he makes oils as well, but he's not going to be able to make these cookies after June 1st. And, uh, and the patients just love them, so it's pity. So what are our biggest um, uh, needs in Israel right now? Uh, our number one biggest need right now is that we need to educate medical professionals. Some of our doctors, many of our doctors, still don't know about the benefits of cannabis, and many doctors still fear cannabis. Um, doctors still fear reprisals for prescribing cannabis and will trust clinical-based trial research. Um, doctors fear becoming pot shops in Israel. So I wanted to say a little bit about what I've noticed as a trainer over the last uh, three and a half years about why patients voluntarily quit using cannabis, something we don't hear a lot about in our industry. Um, uh, some patients quit because new health issues arise. Um, some patients quit because strains change too often, and other patients quit because strains don't change often enough. Um, some patients quit because sufficient training wasn't offered to them and others because support around them decreases for marijuana use. And some patients, even though we subsidize cannabis and it only costs them about a hundred US dollars a month, still can't afford it. Again with the backwards forward thing. It's not me. One more. Future research opportunities. Okay, national health care. What does national health care mean? Um, national health care means that everybody's records are available for retrospective data. 
we can do harm reduction studies like nobody's business in Israel. We can go in and find out as many years as you want before they started using cannabis, while they're using cannabis, and after they stopped using cannabis, exactly what other medications they used and what other conditions they had. It's just a process of crunching numbers for us. That's an incredible strength when you're doing research. Two of the four healthcare groups, that's over 60% of the population, are already participating in providing historical data to the Ministry of Health about cannabis use. Um, researchers coming to Israel don't have to be Israeli, only the PI has to be Israeli, and all the legal growers will compete for research contracts, and uh, all the growers are working on GMP, which is, a standardizing, uh, which is for standardizing methods of production. Um, so, ideas and questions I guess we're saving until afterwards, and uh, I'd be happy to talk to everybody who and more. I could talk about this, uh, of course, I do talk about this all the time. <laughs> Thank you. It's uh, a singular uh, privilege and honor to be here, and I'm humbled uh, to follow such distinguished speakers um, and people who have accomplished so very much in this arena. It's, um, um, now, I, I, I'm going to address a few medical uh, and scientific questions, and, and I'm going to preface my remarks with a video. I'll give you a little background here. This, this is a, um, was a video that was um, produced for, um, really, for, for, to interest investors, quite frankly. Here we are. So Shara has Gervais syndrome, it's a uh, severe pediatric epilepsy. The CD when they start with Gervais have status, they don't stop on their own, so they're 20 minutes or 30 minutes or longer. I think our first one was about a half hour. Um, every seizure after that for two and a half years was a status seizure. And some were four hours long, two hours long, and you know, at that point she's intubated in the ER in the, in the pediatric ICU and medicine doesn't stop them. So that's, um, we went through that for about two and a half years. We got diagnosed at two and a half years old. A few times her heart has stopped during these, uh, using these drugs. And um, I've done CPR on her, and a couple of those times, you know, I just sort of let go of the fact that, just to keep trying with her. I said my goodbyes to her, and um, as I'm doing CPR on her in the hospital, um, kind of prepared myself for the worst. And she's still here, but she's been through a lot to get to this point. The doctor, you know, she heard her, her history of seizures at that time and said, we have to pull this, her last med that she was on. Her exact words, we have reached the end of the line with medical options for Charlotte. And I don't want to tell you, there's really nothing else we can do. And that's when we met the Stanleys, and that's when we got started on the CBD. After six months of, I really didn't think she would survive the seizures, 300 seizures a week, roughly, um, of, you know, grand mal, tonic, chronic seizures a week. Just to put in light what 300 a week is, it's, it's about four an hour. It's a one seizure every 15 minutes. So, um, you know, sometimes it's really five minutes. It just never stopped. And so to see her seizure free for a whole week, for seven days, she went seven days instantly. And we've been on it nine months, and from that 300 seizures a week, she now has zero to one tonic chronic a week. And um, so it's a greater than 99% seizure reduction. And it's amazing. It's just absolutely amazing. To think that she wasn't going to survive, and look at her now, she has a life. She, during that time, she lost the ability to walk, talk, eat, and really just, you know, participate in life at all. She couldn't do anything. She just sort of lied in my arms, catatonic. And I thought that was it. There just wasn't a life for a person. We but stop. here we are. Oh, actually, you go ahead and finish that out. This is just a couple of more seconds. <laughs> Now, um, I, I'm showing you this because, um, and I, I mentioned investors here, uh, we, we need to study this. This has not really been studied. Now, some of you have mentioned CBD, and, and Mr. Lee, uh, I believe, was compelling in his remarks about the importance of CBD. This is the manifestation of CBD, and this needs to be investigated. Um, I, I want to speak to you about evidence-based medicine, and what you just saw is 
evidence, one form of medical evidence. It's an anecdotal evidence piece. It, it really is also potentially a case study. But doctors are taught, and I was at the University of Heidelberg where I went to medical school and at Harvard Medical School where I did my postgraduate training, that we should practice medicine to the best of our ability based on what we know, what medical science teaches us and what research studies uh, indicate is effective and safe for our patients. And of course, we couple that with our own experiences. Now, um, there is evidence that cannabis works. And you know, if you look at a graph like this, which was prepared by a researcher at the Hebrew University, um, uh, Lumir Hanush, you, it looks like there's a lot of research being done. This is from 2008, and in fact, at that point in time, there were about 15,000 studies. Now, it's probably 20,000 in the meantime, and that, as impressive as that looks, when we compare those numbers with, um, we, uh, I'll get to that slide in a moment here, when we compare those numbers with what, um, the amount of research that is being done, it, it, it doesn't look quite so impressive. However, there is evidence research and um, uh, clinical and basic science research that cannabis is beneficial in a variety of different medical conditions. Um, and unfortunately, uh, many of these different um, supporting data are only one or two studies. Uh, this list was put together by Paul Armentano of, of uh, Normal, and he's very much up on the research literature, and there's just not a lot happening. There's a wonderful website run by NIH and FDA called clinicaltrials.gov, and it tracks every clinical trial uh, in the world. There are 143,000 odd in 184 countries. 69,000 of these are in the United States. They have a wonderful search uh, uh, instrument, and you can go in and look, put in any search term you want. I put in marijuana, 348 worldwide out of 143,000. If you put in the term cannabis, 271 come up. Now there's overlap there. Of those 348 trials, 237 are in the United States. Now, <clears throat> if you look further, <clears throat> pardon me, into this and search further, you'll find that of the 237 on marijuana, 73 are on dependence, 39 on withdrawal, 23 on addiction. Now there's overlap there, but well over half probably of the paltry 237 trials underway in the United States are on some negative aspect of marijuana or cannabis. 23 are on pain and only 8 on cancer, even though there is evidence that cannabis can be beneficial in potentially treating cancers or in preventing them. And in fact, we knew that in 1975. The Munson study published in the Journal of the uh, National Cancer Institute showed quite convincingly to me, as I read that paper, that CBD and THC were capable of decreasing the size of solid tumors and in killing cancer cells 38 years ago, and nothing's been done of any appreciable nature. Five of those are on Sativex. Now, I, I don't have a problem with Sativex, really, except this is being done in order to further their application for FDA approval, and I think we may have another new Marinol here. I'm not certain of that. Um, now, the reason for this, I think, is, um, was, was shown quite convincingly and surprisingly candidly in an interview with uh, a UNITA National Institute on Drug Abuse spokeswoman, Shirley Simpson, published in the New York Times in 2010. The article itself, Researchers Find Medical Study of Marijuana Discouraged, and, uh, and in this article she says, as the National Institute on Drug Abuse, our focus is primarily on the negative consequences of marijuana use. We generally do not fund research on the potential beneficial medical effects of marijuana. Okay, that is their mandate from Congress to study the effects of abuse, not just of marijuana, but of many different substances. Unfortunately, they fund 85% or so of the world's research into substances like marijuana. Now, this is important because we can't do much in the way of research on marijuana in the United States. There are four countries in the world that now have national cannabis research, or rather national cannabis uh, programs, national medical cannabis programs. Um, of them, and if we go back here to clinicaltrials.gov, 20 studies are underway in Israel. Two of them are on Sativex. 13 in Canada, nine of which are Sativex, which again is in part, I think, of that uh, 
FDA application process. The Netherlands is doing nine, and the Czech Republic has four, all of which are Sativex. Now, so that makes Israel number two in the world in doing research on cannabis, which is very interesting. Um, now, let me mention Professor Raphael Mishulam. In 1963, 50 years ago, they synthesized CBD and 49 years ago elucidated the structure of THC. He is a national hero. He won the Israel Prize. He has, I don't know, scores of patents. He is a, the, the scientific chairman of the Israel National Academy of Sciences. He said, uh, quoted here, research in Israel is highly respected. In all areas, I think it needs to be said, Israel is the, one of the high-tech leaders um, in the world. Apple has its first non-U.S. research facility in Israel. Microsoft is everywhere doing research. So research is highly respected, and neither the police nor the Ministry of Health have ever raised any major problems. They have been and still are very helpful. And this is true for both, both basic science and clinical studies on cannabis. Now, I met with Rafi Mishulam, um, when I was there in February, and he reiterated this. He, in fact, said, we want people to do cannabis study in Israel. And he wrote out in his own hand a list of things that he has worked on and patented, interestingly, that are, that are cannabis-based or endocannabinoid system-based. Uh, I find that fascinating. That is going on my wall. Um, now, Israel's um, medical cannabis program has been developed, cultured, uh, and, 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 and cultivated, really, is the right word, by some extraordinary people. This is Dr. Yehuda Baruch, whom Mimi mentioned. Um, it was Dr. Baruch who really shepherded their medical cannabis program through the Ministry of Health. Now, remember, the Israeli government is not ill-disposed, nor is the Ministry of Health, to cannabis as a medical treatment. But it's kind of one of those things that they, people don't know a lot about. So it took someone of his caliber to to really help, along with many others. This is in that storage facility, by the way, in a Barbanel. Um, Yossi um, Segev is another who has invested not only time, and he, you saw him dancing at the harvest. He's a remarkably dedicated man, along with his wife. They have put their own funds into this. They have, uh, uh, along with Mimi, along with Dr. Baruch, and many others, shepherded the Israeli program as well. Um, and of course, Mimi has been instrumental in helping patients understand how to use this. We have in the United States a, a, a bit of a conundrum in that, uh, uh, for example, someone comes into my office, and, and Charlotte is a patient of mine, by the way, um, and they um, have absolutely no idea how to use marijuana to treat whatever medical problem there is. I tell them to the best of my ability, but then they go out to a dispensary and I had a patient um, go to a dispensary, and the owner said, um, or the, the guy behind the, 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 the counter, the bud tender, said, nah, you don't want to do that. What you want is 50 milligrams of THC, and I got a nice pill of 50 milligrams right here. Totally wrong for this woman. Totally contravening everything I had said to her, and it confused her, and she called me in tears. So Mimi's function is to help patients understand how to use it. As she said, people are conservative and they're fearful and they don't know what to do, and that's what she does so brilliantly. Um, and it's just a, a true honor and privilege to, to know her and to work with her. Now, let's look at some of the things that impinge on funding of cannabis research in the United States. First, you've got to get your funding. And of course, given all the other steps that are involved, it's kind of difficult to do that. Now, what, it, let's assume that you do get funding. Then you have to get your IRB, Institutional Review Board, approval for a clinical trial. That means a group of people, not necessarily scientists, some religious leaders, law enforcement, other doctors, psychologists, will review your clinical trial proposal to determine that there's nothing in there that's going to harm anybody and that the benefits, the potential uh, benefits anyway, of what you're going to learn may be more uh, important than any risks, but it's to safeguard the subject. So you get your IRB approval. Then, in order to work on cannabis, you have to go through FDA approval, then DEA approval, and finally get NIDA approval. And we've seen NIDA's attitude, as per their own spokeswoman. So this is an extraordinarily difficult process, and as MAPS well knows, 
it doesn't always work the way it's supposed to. In fact, it seldom works the way it's supposed to. NIDA actually has to provide all of the research quali uh, quality cannabis, quote unquote, that's to be used in the study, and, and they say explicitly that their, their supplies are limited. Now let's contrast that to Israel. You get your funding, you get your IRB approval, and you can do the studies. Dr. Baruch told me when I was there, I've been to Israel now twice this year, um, in February for two weeks and in March for two weeks, again meeting with Professor Meshulam uh, and, and Mumi and of course many others. And Dr. Baruch said, if you can get funding and you can get IRB approval, you can do it. Now that is the best carte blanche invitation I've ever had for anything. And I think that uh, it's an opportunity and we need to be jumping on this. In my medical practice, I have seen patients with a variety of different medical conditions um, that uh, actually are, go further than that list, I have to say. And I have prepared some um, protocols that can be quickly translated into clinical trials in Israel. Now, the three that I've really um, worked on that can be uh, quickly implemented are basal cell carcinoma, uh, seizure disorders, and interestingly, metastatic prostate cancer, because there are indications that the one marker we use to, to track the, the, the progression of prostate cancer, prostate-specific antigen, goes down precipitously and pain control is very, very good in, uh, when using concentrates. And this is something that we can explore. Now, as Mimi said, there are only two different dosing forms that are, that are applicable in Israel currently, but we can study anything. And if we do study those things, for example, concentrates for, for cancer, if we do study those and we show benefit, this will translate into not only uh, new dosing forms and ability opportunities to use these, types of treatment options for patients in Israel, but also everywhere. Now, we can look at, there are 800 ALS patients in Israel, for example, and we can look at the progress, how cannabis impacts that. We can use the national healthcare system to go back to do retrospective studies, looking at savings and outcomes. This is an extraordinary opportunity, and I have patients who have benefited significantly in all of these areas. Um, so why should we do research there? Thank you. The research climate is extraordinarily supportive of new and innovative inquiry. Uh, there's a very long history of research into cannabis going back to Rafi Meshulam uh, 50 years ago. Medical marijuana isn't controversial in Israel. Um, there are very few, if any, major governmental or administrative obstacles to doing research there. The research community, the researchers, the physicians, the scientists are highly skilled, very, very motivated, and very excited about doing work in this arena. It's comp comparatively cost-effective to do clinical trials there. It can cost upwards of, of eleven to fifteen thousand dollars per subject here for doing uh, phase one clinical trials, for example, for, for pharmaceutical development. And the national medical insurance programs already support medical marijuana and even pay for it. Now. But of course, we'd have to pay for this, the, the, what's supplied to the subjects. And importantly, in Israel, there's a requirement that if someone benefits from your clinical study, you have to keep giving them that substance because it helps them. <laughs> Here, we're all done. See ya. Now, here are some other practical considerations. 110 million people live in the 18... Uh, states and Washington, D.C. that have medical marijuana legislation in this country. Seventeen more states are now actively considering passing medical marijuana legislation. The Illinois House just a couple of days ago did. Uh, Three million people are already medical cannabis or medical marijuana patients. That number, of course, will increase. And the rapid development of new ways, new treatment options for patients will have significant spillover value back here. Because even though we can't do the research here, we can still use it here. So what we learn in Israel can have immense implications for our ability to treat our patients as effectively as possible in this country. Um, now, aside from being so, you know, so, so America-focused, this will have impact all around the world. Countries in Europe are debating medical cannabis. This Czech Republic's not the first. Uh, to do so, nor will it be the last to implement a program. So what the work that we do in, in clinical trials will benefit not only people here in this country or in Israel, but people everywhere around the world. And I think it's time to get started. Thank you. Oh.
let me, pardon me, let me make one more comment. Um, that video of Charlotte caught the attention of Sanjay Gupta of CNN. And he came out to Colorado, spent two days with that family, and then he followed me to Israel. And he spent uh, two days with me there and interviewed people, some of those, um, unfortunately not all of those whom you saw in this presentation, uh, because the Ministry of Health said you can't do interviews. But there will be a, a, an hour-long special with Sanjay Gupta on this subject in June. I don't know when, but it's important. And as you've heard from so many people, things are changing, and they're changing rapidly, and it's, uh, it's a train that's gathering speed. Thank you again.